Welcome to today's GNCC Espresso Live with our distinguished guest, the Acting Medical Officer of Health for Niagara Region, Dr. Herji. Dr. Herji, thank you so very much for being with us. And to all of our participants, I'm really glad you were able to join us. My name is Mishka Balsam, and I will be your moderator for the next hour. Throughout the pandemic, we have learned that change is ever constant, and these past four weeks have been no different. Since our January Espresso Live with Dr. Herji, a number of factors have changed, especially for businesses. The Ontario government announced, based on the decline of hospitalization and ICU admissions, that the provincial government reopening plan would be fast-tracked. As of last week, some public health measures were eased, among them the increase of social gathering limits and removing capacity limits for indoor settings. And in a week from now, on March the 1st, the province intends to take additional steps to ease public health measures. They are planning to lift the proof of vaccination requirements for all settings, while business can choose to continue to require such proof. And although masking requirements will maintain in place, the government is planning to announce at a later date when this is to be lifted as well. In addition, there has been an expansion of booster dose eligibility to youth of the ages of 12 to 17. And when we take a look at the federal level, the Canadian government is eliminating the pre-arrival PCR testing requirement for fully vaccinated travelers starting on February 28th. And travelers can now opt for a cheaper rapid antigen test taken 24 hours before their scheduled flight. And in addition, the government eased its advisory, which recommended in the past for Canadians to avoid non-essential travel. With that in mind, I thank you for being with us today to get a better understanding on our current situation, especially right here in Niagara. What is our current case count? What does the vaccination look like? What can we expect and how do we can we be best prepared for it? Often in advance of this espresso, you, our audience, provide us with questions. This week has been no different. We received a high number of them and we are committed to getting to all of them. But just for those of you who are joining us for the first day, the format of our espresso with Dr. Herji includes an update from Dr. Herji, which usually lasts around 25 to 30 minutes, which will then be followed by an interactive Q&A session. So we really encourage all of you to utilize the chat function or the raise hand function if you want to talk live and uh, to ensure that your questions are being answered. For those of you who wish to enable live transcript, please refer to the bottom of your Zoom screen for that option as well. And on that note, um, Dr. Herjee, may I move the webinar over to you for your overview? Um, I'm going to do something a little bit different, I think, this time, which is I'm going to spend a little less time talking about the current situation and a bit more time looking forward to what we might expect and I think how we make sure that we stay in a good position with COVID-19 going into the long term. But I'll start off by making a few comments about what the situation looks like in Ontario and, uh, and in Niagara as well. So, you know, this was, I think, already highlighted that we are seeing very positive trends with our hospitalization data. So this is the provincial hospitalization numbers. And we can see that after the peak in early January, we've thankfully seen those numbers really come down quite a bit. I do want to caution, though, that if we look where we are versus where we were through the summer fall, we are still much higher. And even if we look at that compared to past waves of infection, we're still pretty high in terms of hospitalization. So the situation isn't completely resolved yet. It's definitely trending in the right direction. But that is, of course, a reason, I think, to be cautious of where we head in the future so that we don't see some sort of rebound like we did see after the second wave last year heading into a third wave. The Niagara data in terms of hospitalizations, again, you know, looks quite positive. The ICU numbers have flattened out a little bit, but you know we're on their way down and certainly aren't heading up. And Niagara Health is breaking out the hospitalizations who are being treated versus COVID-19, as opposed to those who maybe had an incidental result showing in COVID-19. And of course, that number is you know similar to that pattern trending down, which is of course really good news. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about total case numbers here, just because most people aren't getting, aren't even able to be tested. So we really don't have an accurate sense of it. But within that restricted group of people who are hospital workers, long-term care home residents, 
people are hospitals hospitalized, we are seeing their infections going down. And so hopefully that mirrors what's happening in the rest of society. I don't think though we should compare this number to what we saw at previous points because only a small subset of people are actually even being able to be tested. And probably the real number is significantly higher than this. And to that point, of course, if this number is higher, I think it gives you some sense that we are still dealing with a pretty high uh, number of infections going around in the community and it's not necessarily completely over yet. The Niagara trend here, very similar. We've of course seen that higher risk group who still is able to get tested community to trend down. But again, the real number of infections is probably significantly higher than that. Better than looking at the raw infections number, though I think we can look at a, the percent positivity metric. And so this is the percent of people who get tested who end up with a positive test. Um, ignore this dark line. This is the number of tests in total being done in the province. I don't think that's as important as this orange line, which is the percent of tests that are coming back positive. You can see that last year when we went through the second wave, you know, people who had symptoms were more likely having symptoms because of COVID-19. So when they were getting a test, they were more likely testing positive. And so you saw that percent positivity number go up. And in the third wave, it went up again. And in the early fall, we had a little bit of an increase in cases. It went up again there. And you can see there's a very sharp increase over this Omicron wave. And thankfully that number has been coming down. And so that's definitely what we wanted to see that the infections are on their way down, which the percent positivity shows us. Well, we can see this percent positivity is still higher than we were at any previous wave of the pandemic. And so I think probably the true number of infections remains quite high out there. Public Health Agency of Canada used to define 5% as kind of a threshold that if you're above that, you had an extremely high percent positivity. And of course, we are well higher than that. We take a look at the Niagara data here. We can see we've come down a little bit, though we do seem to be plateauing out a little bit in terms of the percent positivity. And I'll come back to that in a second. The other thing we can look at is wastewater data. It turns out that if we're infected with COVID-19, we excrete COVID-19 into our waste. And so if we examine our sewage and wastewater data, we can pick up signals of COVID-19. That can give us a sense of how much infection might actually be out there. And so this is what the provincial overall data has looked like where, you know, the Omicron wave happened, there was a big surge of COVID-19 picked up in wastewater and that has come down. And you can see that after the February 1st uh, beginning of reopening in the province, we've seen that kind of decline slow down, but at a provincial level, it still seems to be heading downwards. It's interesting though, that when we start to break that out across different regions of the province, it's not necessarily the same everywhere. So the North is actually, you can see they had their Omicron wave and they've already had a resurgence of infections and their number of infections remains quite high. Eastern Ontario, you know, they seem to have plateaued at a, at a high level, perhaps starting to trend down. And from Eastern Ontario, it's kind of spread to maybe the area east of the GTA here where they're seeing a resurgence of infections. Southwest Ontario has also had a little bit of a resurgence. It's primarily the GTA that seems to be driving that provincial downwards trend. We are here in the central west region, so the area west of the GTA. And you can see we've kind of plateaued in what we're seeing with our wastewater data, at least in a regional sense. And there's maybe just a small sense that things might be starting to head upwards a little bit. So that's something I'm gonna be paying very close attention to going forward. And I think it is a reminder that things aren't necessarily completely over. This is going to remain, I think, an environment we need to watch carefully. And if we take a look at what the Ontario Science Table was modeling at the start of this month, they you know, were tracking the infections from the Omicron wave going up and starting to come down. And they laid out three scenarios of what might happen. You know, The red is the worst case, yellow is kind of the middle case, green was the better case. And fortunately, we do seem to follow this green scenario in terms of hospital numbers, where our hospital numbers have come down uh, they were about last week around 2000, which is right where it was predicted. We seem to be actually a little bit below 2000 hospitalizations now. So we've actually maybe done a little better than that scenario, which is really good news. But you can see in all these scenarios that at the end of February, you start to see things go back up or at least start to plateau out. And so I think that's where the concern right now is, is are we gonna hopefully, you know, see this continue to go down? 
or is this going to resurge a little bit and we may end up with a plateauing of infections or a small increase in infections and therefore a small increase in hospitalizations as well. If we look at what Public Health Ontario was saying, they kind of had similar thoughts and they laid out three scenarios of what could happen. We see an incomplete decline in cases and a resurgence as we start to lift some of the measures in society. We could plateau at a moderate to high rate of transmission, or we could see a slow and steady decline in transmission. I think we're all hoping this is what we see, but their assessment is that probably the more likely scenario is this is going to be what would transpire and that we would see a plateauing of infections remaining relatively high. And so I think that's you know consistent with what we're seeing with that science table data along that green curve. And I think one of the reasons we do wanna be cautious going forward, and one of the reasons why I think the provinces may be a bit too aggressive in terms of their March 1st of lifting everything, because I think there is a very real chance we could see that plateau. And I think we wanna be careful to make sure that we uh, you know, are still able to respond to it if that does happen. One other data I want to just point out here with the science tables modeling is that they factored in that if we did more booster doses over the course of February, what would that do? And I think unsurprisingly, but optimistically, it shows that if you got more booster doses out, all of these trends start to look a little better than they would otherwise. And so if we can hopefully get more people to get booster doses and continue to sell those booster doses to people, we'll increase our chances that this reopening will proceed as successfully as we all hope it will and we'll be able to you know, put past most of these restrictions to COVID-19 going forward. The not so good news then is that if we look at our actual vaccine uptake, we can see that this is how many doses have been delivered every day. Of course, through December, January, we had a quite a big surge of in, uh, uh, vaccine uptake compared to where we were in October and November. We've unfortunately seen those numbers come quite a bit down and we're not seeing the strong uptake in terms of booster doses or vaccine doses, even with first and second doses, nearly as much. And I'm hoping we can convince the public to, you know, start to take up those vaccine doses much more because we're heading to a point where the province is going to have really minimal protections in place. And so we're going to need that vaccine more than ever to protect us. And I think it's really important we do everything we can to continue to encourage people to get those vaccine doses. Just quickly showing you what the vaccine uptake has looked like. Orange are the first doses blue here are the second doses, and then green are the booster doses. And, you know, key data here for looking at our adult population, you know, over 90% of people have a first dose, almost as many have got that second dose, and a strong majority of adults have a booster dose. And so I think, you know, people with a booster dose are the majority of people in our society now. And people, I think, are rightly making that decision. And Particularly when I see, you know, protests like the one we saw in Ottawa lately, that I think represents a very small minority, fortunately, and most people understand vaccines are really important for us to get through this pandemic, and def definitely getting the vaccines. Still want to, of course, encourage more people in these sort of younger and middle age groups to get their booster doses because we haven't seen the same uptake in them as we have in this older group. And I think there's still more work to do to make sure we get our children vaccinated so that they can have protection as well as they you know, stay in school and get back to their extracurricular activities, that they will, of course, be protected as well. Just showing you this graph here in terms of the level of protection provided by the vaccine. So, you know, August through, you know, November, December, this dark line is how effective was the vaccine. And, you know, between 80 to 90 percent effective, that vaccine was doing very well. We can see in early December, we see a sharp drop off in vaccine effectiveness with the Omicron wave, but then it seems to climb back up to 60%. And this, I think, represents people getting booster doses. And so with the Omicron variant, we unfortunately didn't have nearly as good protection against infection, but once we got that booster dose, that level of protection came back up. And this, again, is with only 57% of adults having gotten that booster dose. I think if we got that you know, number up close to the 90% of people who've gotten vaccinated, we could potentially be seeing protection from infection not too dissimilar to what we are seeing before. There was a question in one of the ones that was submitted, you know, noting that uh, are we going to maybe see new vaccines that are going to make sure that we are preventing infection and preventing spread of infection? 
And I'd actually argue that we do actually have a current vaccine that is very effective at stopping protection, uh, infection. The only thing is we need that booster dose to make sure that we stop protection, of, stop infections and stop transmission of infection. What I think they were getting at is this, that even with the Omicron variant, we saw protection from being in an ICU, protection from being in a hospital remain quite high. And with a booster dose, it's maybe gone up a little bit. And that's, I think, really good news, that people who are vaccinated have a very low chance of becoming hospitalized or having a severe outcome. Unfortunately, two doses didn't do enough to prevent infections, but with that booster dose, it definitely came back up. And so I think we already have a really good vaccine. Not sure if future vaccines perhaps might perform better, but I think we still have a good vaccine and we should still believe in that vaccine going forward. And just to show a little bit more data here around booster doses, this is some latest data coming out of Ontario. These black dots represent Delta infections. And this is, you know, how many days after your second dose are you? So, you know, within the first two months, within the first four months, six months, eight months, et cetera. Uh, you can see against the Delta variant, we did see some waning of protection, but it remained quite high. Unfortunately, with the Omicron variant, two doses of infections led to this pretty big drop off in protection. It started off not too bad, but it drops off quite quickly. What we see here is that if you get another dose of mRNA in, within the first six days, your protection is actually right back to where it was with those first two doses. And after one week, your protection has gone up quite substantially. It's over 60% protection against the Omicron variant. And so again, this shows that the importance of that booster dose that with two doses, we don't seem to retain our immunity, but once we get that third dose as a booster, it really jumps our immunity right back up. Small little other detail I just want to quickly point out here that this is breaking out a Pfizer booster dose versus a Moderna booster dose. And it's interesting if you compare the Moderna dots to the Pfizer dots, the Moderna dots are a little bit higher. And I actually do think that Moderna for most people is going to be the better booster dose because it does seem consistent, you know, if we look at UK data or, you know, other countries data, the Moderna vaccine does provide a little bit better protection. But the key message here is that that booster dose does give us quite good protection against infection. And of course, if we're looking then here against the Delta variant, it was of course really excellent, um, but we're sadly not dealing with that more easily to control variant anymore. So that's it I wanna say about the current situation. I now wanna turn my thoughts over to where we are headed in the future, because I think that's really important. And I think, you know, a big comment that's been going around and a lot of discussions going around about this idea of endemic COVID and switching to endemic and getting past the, you know, really, I think, restrict, uh, restrictive policies and the social disruption that we've had to experience over the last two years and hopefully putting it that behind us. I want to start off by just really, you know, again, taking stock of what are the stakes we're dealing with here. Now, this is US data. This is uh, from their National Center for Health Statistics. I haven't seen it as good data in Canada, so I'm pulling this US graph. And it's looking at pneumonia, influenza, and COVID-19 mortality. And I don't want to focus too much on this line, just very quickly. This line is kind of showing what the seasonal variation would be because you're going to have more pneumonia, influenza in winter time, so it's going to be going up. This red line is what was actually seen, and you can see in 2018, maybe there was more deaths from uh, influenza because that was a particularly bad influenza year. But I don't really wanna focus on those lines. What I really wanna focus on here is down these yellow bars here. And this represents the number of deaths from influenza. So 2018, a particularly bad year, so it was a bit higher, and you can see that shape really mirrors that shape there. 2019, not quite as bad, and then we have, you know, uh, late 2019 going into the first 10 weeks of 2020. These are the number of deaths that we had from influenza. And of course, 10 weeks into 2020 is March, and that's when uh, the pandemic COVID-19 hits. And this is what happened to mortality after that point, where you see these blue uh, areas representing COVID-19 mortality. And I think the key thing to note is just how much higher this is than the yellow we see from influenza. I think many people, you know, dismiss COVID-19 as just another influenza and it's not that big a deal. And I think this shows the US data of deaths from COVID-19 were massive compared to the deaths from influenza. This is unfortunately not just another influenza. And I think we do need to take it seriously. 
Now, this is US data, and the good news is, is that the uh, deaths in the US are more than three times higher per capita than Canada. So take all of this and cut it by a third, and you get you know, much more similar to what we saw in Canada, both because we are more aggressive about combating COVID-19 through 2020 and much of 2021. And then in the latter part of 2021, people in Canada got the vaccine more, and that kept our mortality much lower. So fortunately, it's not nearly as bad as this graph shows, but I think we would still probably have significant mortality from COVID-19 compared to influenza. And so that is something that we do need to be mindful of, that this is not something that we can just dismiss. This is, you know, as an infection that is going to remain with us in society, it's going to still be causing quite a lot of harm, quite a lot of deaths. And it's not just, unfortunately, deaths that are a concern. We do know that there is long COVID. And this is just a headline that I saw yesterday in the Washington Post discussing people who have these ongoing cardiovascular symptoms after having a COVID-19 infection. And so there's going to be perhaps a long-term burden of chronic disease that we're also going to have to manage due to COVID-19. It's not just going to be that short-term impact of the hospitalizations and the deaths. And so I think it is you know, very much in our interest to try and find a sustainable way to keep COVID infections down. So we prevent these long-term chronic illnesses. We also keep deaths, we keep hospitalizations down and our society is able to move forward in a sustainable way. Now, I think our hope initially was that the vaccine would do us, uh, you know, basically to keep the virus under control. And over time, you've seen successive different variants come through that have impacted that. So, you know, our original version of the virus that came out of Wuhan had a reproductive number about 2.4. So every person who's infected would spread infection to about two and a half uh, people. And so over time, that means the infection would grow. Assuming their vaccine is about 95% effective, we could have got to herd immunity, which basically means that there'd be enough protection in society that the virus just couldn't really spread and it would kind of die out and it would be controlled by that level of vaccination. And it used to be that if we just got 60% of people vaccinated, we could have had it completely under control. Uh, we had a new variant emerge in the spring of 2020, which is what we actually dealt with. But still, we had a chance of getting to herd immunity with that virus. The alpha variant, the virus became able to spread more quickly, infecting more people. The effectiveness of the vaccine fell a little bit, and we ended up with a you know, herd immunity threshold more around the mid-80% range. Noting, though, that we are, you know, in the order of 80 to 83 percent of people are fully vaccinated. So we are actually had a chance of getting pretty close to that still uh, where we are. The Delta uh, variant, though, again, more difficult to control. Vaccine became less effective. And now we start to see that herd immunity threshold really get you know, pretty far out of reach. Though maybe if enough people got vaccinated, the rest could get immunity from the infection itself, maybe we would get close to herd immunity and we would have the virus controlled. Unfortunately, with the Omicron variant, it is this really crazy 20 or greater reproductive number, which makes it you know, on the order of measles and perhaps you know, one of the most infectious diseases we have in total. Two doses of vaccine, again, shows not that great protection, but with three doses, it's much better. But again, not as good as it was to previous variants. And the combination of it being so infectious and the vaccine not working as well means that there's no theoretical way that we can even get to herd immunity anymore. And especially if this you know, um, vaccine wanes in its immunity, that's going to make it even more difficult. And I think vaccine on its own or mostly based on vaccine, we're not necessarily going to be able to control COVID-19 anymore. And I think we need to be really clear-eyed about that, that we need to maybe change our strategy from relying just on vaccines. Not to say vaccines are bad. Every person who gets a dose of vaccine is helping us to keep back the infection under control, and they're reducing a chance someone's going to be burdening our hospital sector. But we're probably going to need to do more than just use vaccination. As of course, you know, we unfortunately probably will see new variants probably the vaccine efficacy will go down again. We may see a, you know, variants that are going to spread even more easily. And so we will see new waves of infection as variants evolve. And just, you know, as we get farther away from our booster doses, you know, six, nine months from our booster doses, our immunity is probably going to wane, which will mean that even if it's still the Omicron variant, that Omicron variant is going to be able to pick up and start to spread more. And 
when some modeling has been done, this is, for example, in the UK of what it's going to look like in the longer term with uh, infections. This was based on the Delta variant rather than the Omicron variant, but I think it still shows the idea that assuming we have waning from booster doses, we'll see infections surge up and come down and surge up and come down. It's not going to be a simple you know, path where things stay stable over the long term. Even if we have long lasting immunity from boosters, we still have the ups and downs going on. And just highlighting that these are hospital admissions and you know this is a log scale. So 10, 100,000. So this is, you know, an increase there is actually disproportionate to what's actually represented here. We see this with other diseases that are endemic. So this is pertussis. Early 80s, we got a really good vaccine against pertussis. And you can see for a period, pertussis actually came quite down. Pertussis is whooping cough. But then we started to see these big waves of whooping cough come back. And you know, we had a new vaccine that came out in the late 90s, plus uh, people, of course, had some immunity from the infection. And that fortunately controlled it a little bit again. But you can see here in the 2011, 2012, we started to see it go back up. And unfortunately, this graph doesn't continue on, but we did see another wave of whooping cough during those years. And so just because we have an endemic disease doesn't mean that we're not going to see waves again. And then, of course, influenza is an endemic disease. And this is what we see with influenza every year, where we have a spike of cases over the winter months every year. Uh, notably, of course, the last couple of years, we haven't seen it because everything we did to stop COVID-19 stopped influenza by and large as well. And I just, you know, for future reference, just want to point out that if you look at the, you know, largest peak here, it's in January, the largest peak is in January, largest peak is in January, largest peak is in January. I'll come back to that in a moment, that January does seem to be a particularly high risk point, perhaps because it's the middle of winter, but I think there's some other reasons. Key takeaway here, though, is COVID-19, I think, is going to probably see more waves as we see new variants emerge, as we get farther from our booster doses and our immunity wanes, and we need to be prepared for making sure we can sustainably deal with those recurrences of infections going forward. Now, influenza um, every year overwhelms our healthcare system. Um, it you know, doesn't quite push it past its brink, but it's basically pushed right up to its brink Unfortunately, those hospitalizations go down every winter, but it's a really difficult time for hospitals. This is looking at a headline in 2018. This is the headline in 2019 from Hamilton. Again, you know, hospitals becoming overwhelmed with flu. And so if we think about it, hospitals are already stretched with influenza every winter, and we add in COVID-19 in some fashion, even if it's not as much as it currently is, that's going to really push our hospitals past probably the break. So one path out of this is, of course, we throw a lot more money into our healthcare system, we build up our hospitals, we hire more healthcare workers, so we can sustainably deal with high numbers of COVID infections on top of our influenza infections every winter. I don't know how realistic that is, given that you know, we need to perhaps have infrastructure in hospitals, but more importantly, we need the people, the healthcare workers trained to actually do that. So I think there's, per, you know, this is perhaps not going to work out as well as we hope. And just because the virus becomes endemic, I don't think is necessarily going to mean we're going to be past this. But I think there is a pathway out of this. And that's to look at what has happened with other infections in our society. If we go back 100 years, these were the top five causes of death in Canada. And I'll just show in comparison, these are, you know, in 2017, what are the top causes by Stats Canada? Key thing here is that if we look at tuberculosis and diarrheal diseases, two of the top causes of death in Canada in 1910, basically, you know, well off the top 10 and basically unheard of of causing death. How many times have you heard of someone dying of one of these diseases anymore? And so what happened with these infections that made them go away? I'll start off with tuberculosis. And, you know, with tuberculosis, we can see the fatality rate for tuberculosis really went down over the course of the early half of the 1900s. We got a vaccine around the 1940s. By the 1950s, we had antibiotics. And actually, isoniazid is still the medication we, we use to treat for tuberculosis. So these are really good medications. But you can see the fatality rate from tuberculosis came down quite a bit before that. And what actually happened is that we did a bunch of things that reduced people's risk of actually been getting the infection and then surviving the infection if they did get it. It has nothing to do with medical care. 
being got better quality housing, so people's living standards are better, that made them healthier. Tuberculosis spreads to the airborne route, so better quality housing, less crowded housing, meant fewer people got infected. We had better quality working conditions, so people were healthier at work. We reduced air pollution. If you're fighting off tuberculosis and your lungs have to fight off the injury caused by air pollution, that seems to reduce your chance of survival. So we reduced air pollution and we actually made it easier for people to recover from a tuberculosis infection. We got better hygiene. It used to be a social norm that people are out and about and spitting in public. And we had campaigns in the early 1900s to make that no longer socially acceptable, which actually reduced people's ability to spread infection to others. We you know, started out public health to do really good contact tracing, so we should isolate infections and stop its spread. And sorry, doing all of that basically meant that uh, we are able to basically take tuberculosis off this top five list and basically make it unheard of. To focus in then on diarrheal diseases, you know, I think a similar story happened there. Big thing we did is we got sanitation. That all that virus that were in bacteria were excreting from our human bodies. We found a safe way to get rid of it and treat it so that we would basically inactivate it. And sanitation has been rated one of the 150 greatest medical, one of the greatest medical advances in the last 150 years, because it has probably contributed more to people's health than really anything else. On top of sanitation, we tried to treat our water to make sure that there weren't pathogens in our water, so we were safe from that. We improved our living conditions, improved our building codes so that we could take advantage of these sewage systems and water treatment to have clean water and clean sewage disposal in our homes. We separated people from where they lived from infections reservoirs. So prior to good sanitation, people would actually live by a cesspool and we'd have open sewers and people would be living by those things because we didn't realize that those were actually causes of infection. Once we learned about that, we moved people away from those uh, sources of infection to make sure that they weren't as likely to get sick. And you know, just to show, you know, Chicago has a really interesting story where they raised their streets because they covered over their sewers, which meant that their entire city's landmass ended up 14 meters higher. Buildings now had to be redesigned with steps going up to the second floor because that was now the new entryway and the lower floors became basements. They tunneled into the lake to get past the sources of uh, sewage going into the lake to make sure they're getting clean water for drinking. And they actually reversed a river where a lot of sewage was spilling out into to basically redirect that river away from others. So pretty massive public works projects to separate people from sources of infection. Other things, we improved people's working conditions as well to make sure infections weren't around there. We regulated our food production so we didn't have bacteria getting into our food production and causing people those diarrheal illnesses. We made sure the water we're using for irrigation of our crops was clean water so it also didn't have pathogens in it that was gonna contaminate our food. We inspect food premises in public health to make sure the food people eat is gonna be safe. We do lots of contact tracing and it's become a social norm that we wash our hands if they get dirty or before we eat. And that also makes sure that we are less likely to get infected. And all of these things and plus improving people's just general health by improving nutrition, standards of living, makes them better able to fight off infections. And so none of this is really medical. It's about changing our society and by doing that, we actually got rid of the risk of diarrheal illness. And this actually goes to a key public health principle, which I'm not sure I've talked to this audience about, but when we look at what drives our health, the social conditions in which we live, the environment in which we live, contributes to the majority of our health. Healthcare is important. Our biology and genetics, of course, have some impact on our health, but really the socioeconomic, the environmental conditions in which we live really drive our health. And I think if we want to control COVID-19 for the long term in a sustainable way, this is where we need to turn our focus, particularly, I think, over this spring and summer, if we are able to, you know, not see any kind of resurgence, the good weather in summer will protect us from infection and give us a chance to do something so we're better prepared for the fall and winter. One of those, of course, is ventilation. We know ventilation reduces COVID-19. Now's the time to update building codes and you know have government investment to make sure we can improve our ventilation in all areas where there's risk. This is a you know image from Japan of a movie theater where they're actually showing CO2 readings in all of their uh, cinemas and what in all of their screens and sorry for their cinema. And what it's showing is basically that if you have low CO2, that means that you have good ventilation because all the air people are breathing out is being removed 
and you're bringing in fresh air with less CO2. And so they're actually having public disclosure of this to make sure people are aware that they have good ventilation in their movie cinemas. Uh, one thing we've done in the last two summers is we moved a lot of dining outdoors here. Why don't we make this something permanent? Make sure that we don't see COVID-19 in our summer months by moving a lot of social activity outdoors. And we have such good weather here in the summers. Hopefully this can be a bit of a tourist, you know, a, a treat for people. And maybe even restaurants can have more people they can serve in the summer because they're going to be able to expand more seating outdoors in transition to the seating they have indoors. I talked about earlier how we see a surge of influenza every January. And what happens every December? As we, of course, have our winter holidays, people around Christmas time, New Year's time gather. And unfortunately, that means people who may be infected with influenza spread it to their friends and family. And in January, we go back to work, we go back to school, we bring that illness with us and we spread it to everybody else in work and school and so spreads even farther. And so that's why we see that big jump in influenza infections every January. What if we readjusted our calendar? We have our winter holiday, but we don't all go back to school and work right away in January. We have an extended holiday. And so there's a bit of a washout period. So when we do go back to work and school, we're not bringing infection with us. So we don't see that spike in influenza infections, but we likewise don't see a spike in COVID-19 infections. And so that actually might sustainably reduce our COVID-19 and make a wave we have in the winter something more manageable. Another thing we can do is uh, if people are going to work when they're sick, they can spread infection. Lots of people though don't are kind of forced to go to work. They don't have the opportunity to stay home if they're sick. And that we know has driven some of the COVID-19 infection we've seen. Let's legislate paid sick days, have government funding to help us do the transition to make that permanent. And that way people can stay home. And of course, if they can work from home, great. We've invested a lot of work from home infrastructure. We can use it to keep people safe. And if we don't have that and people do need to go to work, hopefully they'll be able to stay home sick and not necessarily spread infection. Japan does a lot of work about tracing clusters of infection in public places with contact tracing. I think we should continue doing that. We know that poorer neighborhoods, neighborhoods with higher minority populations are more likely to be hit hard with COVID-19 hospitalizations. If we can invest in making those populations safer and hopefully improving their integration in society, we can hopefully sustainably improve, you know, reduce the risk long-term in our society. This is a bit of a more long-term issue, but I think it's something we can do. And of course, we're getting new medications for COVID-19. That's going to help us. We're getting new vaccines for COVID-19, maybe even, you know, variant-specific booster shots. That's hopefully going to help us. If we can vaccinate the rest of the world, where there's unfortunately very low vaccine uptake in parts of the world, we can hopefully also reduce the risk of uh, new variants emerging. And given that everything can happen in the right, you know, immediately, I think for a transition period, if we can keep wearing masks, that'll hopefully keep us safe. And unfortunately, the province hasn't done this, but I think if we can have proof of vaccination in the short term as a transition period, especially if we can incorporate booster doses into it, I think that would be really advisable. And I'm very pleased to see that there's many businesses in Niagara who are opting to uh, continue with proof of vaccination. I'm planning to put out a statement really supporting those businesses in the coming days and hoping to advise the public to be very supportive of those businesses that continue on that because I think they're making a really important choice that's going to help us through this next few months as we try and transition to something sustainable. And so I think if we do these kinds of changes, it will mean we adapt our society, it will mean a little bit of investment by government to make this transition. I think we can hopefully get to a place where we bring our COVID-19 infections down we actually probably bring those influenza infections down as well because these same measures will stop influenza. And in aggregate, that lower level of influenza and of COVID-19 will be something our society can handle. And so we won't see our hospitals overwhelmed. And also will have made our society actually healthier for the long term. And I think that's our pathway out of this pandemic at this point. And if we can do that, you know, hopefully we won't see these kinds of stats where we see huge waves of COVID-19 deaths and will be at something that is sustainable for the long term. I've talked a little bit more than I hoped for there, but I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to some questions.
Dr. Hoji, thank you so very much for the update. It's always greatly appreciated. And I also wanted to say that I appreciated uh, you outlining actually other options that are available to us other than vaccinations uh, that are there. Options that we can do within our workplaces, patterns, and that we can follow as individuals. And I think it's really good for us to kind of broaden our horizon and seeing what is our individual role, what is our role as an employer in it, and as a government to support the health of our community. So thank you for taking that extra time on it. I am actually going to uh, look at uh, looking at some of the questions that have come in via the chat and some of the ones that have been um, already submitted to us. And I think in light of what you said uh, towards the end of it, I, I think it's maybe a really good time to talk about um, what is happening after March 1st. Um, and you had uh, spoke or you spoke about that some businesses will want to check vaccine status uh, of patrons, even though they're no longer obligated to do so by the province. And we have spoken to some of our members, some do, some don't. Um, but one of the things that the individuals and the businesses that want to continue it have asked for, do you have any suggestions for messaging those businesses are interested in doing this could use to explain why they're going above and beyond the provincial law? And I think- yeah that is really critical that maybe a, it's a consistent message, uh, it would help them. And especially if we're looking at uh, the, the workers and individuals that are dealing with it, it's often a younger group of individuals that are going to be faced with it. And anything that uh, your department could offer uh, to assist that messaging. Yeah, absolutely. And this is actually one of the reasons why I want to put out a strong statement in support of this to really give some backup to those businesses that they can point to public health and use us as part of their justification. If there's other things we can do, please do let us know. I'd really open to hearing that feedback. And, you know, there'll be a message supporting businesses doing this, but also a message to the public as well to really, you know, be, you know, understanding of businesses are doing this and to be supportive of them ideally, that they're doing things to keep us all safe. And we wanna, of course, reward them for doing that. Um, I'm also uh, thinking on these lines that, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, I, oh yes, the, the one other thing that I, you know, really want to highlight here is that, you know, I do want to continue highlighting that there is some risk of infection spreading going forward. And so, you know, that is, I think, important. And hopefully if by getting that message out to the public, they will hopefully be a bit more understanding of this. I think one way businesses can hopefully message this is to really highlight that they are doing this for the safety of their customers and for the safety of their staff and really trying to promote this as a feature and a positive element of their business that they are taking extra steps to keep everybody safe as we make this transition to endemic COVID-19. And hopefully that is a message that will resonate with a lot of the public, especially since we see the majority of the public has gotten fully vaccinated and has gotten their booster doses and probably are believers in vaccination. And so I think they will hopefully be a receptive audience to that message. Yeah, thank you very much. So I think there's appreciation from our audience today too, and just helping those businesses uh, that make that decision, but still fully accepting and respecting the decisions and the freedom that business have in making that decision. There's another question uh, similar to not 100%. Are the Section 22 mm -hmm. orders and letters of instruction currently in place for Niagara are expected to expire on March 1st? Yeah, there's technically no expiry date to them, but we are reevaluating their ongoing need this week. We want to see what the final wording of regulations is by the province for March 1st, so we can see exactly what's going to go forward. A lot of what's in those orders and letters of instructions is actually reinforcing things in the provincial regulations or enforcing and having better monitoring of what's in the provincial regulations. And if those go away, it of course makes little sense. Um, I think you can expect most likely there will be scaling back and possibly repeal of those, but I don't want to say exactly what's going to happen until we've seen the final regulations and made a final decision on that. We hope to have a communications out to everybody by the end of the week, though, so that they will know well before March 1st. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, the more advance notice individuals have and business have, the easier it is for them. Uh, the next question is related to social gatherings um, and travel too, but I want to kind of split the two of them because I think it's different scenarios that there. 
we look at it and we say the importance of people to gather together for their own mental well-being and moving forward from it. Uh, laws and restrictions notwithstanding, what are your recommendations for social gatherings? <clears throat> and social gatherings, we can look at it small ones around in a restaurant and a group of people, but we also have to start looking at bigger ones, uh, sports gatherings, concerts, uh, events that people want to it, attend. What are your thoughts on, what are your recommendations when it comes to that? Yeah, so I think this is going to be less of a black and white yes or no, and I think more for risk assessment everybody's going to need to make for themselves. Uh, you know, I've shown the data, I think infections are still quite high in the community. On the flip side, a lot of us have vaccinations and a lot of us have booster doses, which is going to protect us. And so if you're going to a social gathering where everybody is vaccinated, that's of course going to mean the risk is a lot lower. If you're at a social gathering where people are going to be wearing masks, of course, that's going to definitely make it a lot safer but it's never going to be perfectly safe. And so a consideration is, of course, you know, what is your health status? So do you feel you're someone who's vulnerable? Do you have maybe vulnerable people in your home? And if you do, maybe you want to be a little bit more cautious or and especially insist upon going to gatherings where people might be wearing masks or where you know everybody's going to be fully vaccinated. And I think, you know, everybody needs to make an individual choice now based on the risk. Thinking about, you know, mask wearing, vaccination, making sure people who are sick aren't coming there. Uh, and, you know, deciding, do you feel safe enough with those in place, knowing that your risk isn't zero, but it's going to make you a lot safer, versus maybe you're not so concerned about your own health, you're not concerned that you have vulnerable people in your home, and you're willing to take a bit more risk, and maybe you're not going to worry as much about those elements. Yeah, that makes sense. There's a follow-up question to just this dialogue that we're having here. Is the goal of Niagara Public Health to align with the provincial regulations for March 1st, or go above and uh, above these. Many operational concerns if the standards are different at the door of various facilities. Again, it speaks to what we just talked about, but it's one of our um, participants today who's really kind of trying to define it more. And it is going to be a more difficult situation um, with individuals making different and businesses making different choices and decisions. Yeah. So I think the intention is we want to be pretty closely aligned. I can't say with 100% we would have alignment uh, where we might keep some very small targeted type measures, which would be beyond what the province has. So if I'm thinking about the Section 22 uh, order on restaurants, we have a requirement for hand sanitizer at every table. Like if we kept something like that, that would probably be above the province's requirement but it hopefully wouldn't be interfering with anything the province has. And I don't think we want to see any kind of interference where there's a conflict within the rules, but there might be small, you know, targeted measures that could be above, but we may decide to actually eliminate those completely because I'm not sure how much value they would have either. I don't want to make any final decisions though until we've seen the final regulations working, but hopefully that gives us a sense it's heading towards very close alignment to IPA. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, a follow up too has come forward is what are people to do if I tested positive for the Omicron variant? Uh, in the past, we looked at a number of days of isolating the household that I live in, the other participants of the household also isolated. Do you foresee any changes to that in the immediate future? And I think these are really critical aspects to an employer because they are the ones who also have to put them in place and follow them and ensure that they're colleagues, their staff are following them at the same time. So it'll be up to the province to set those guidelines. We've generally uh, just, you know, we shared what the province has for those. The sense I'm getting is we may be moving to a point where people who have booster doses wouldn't need to isolate if they, you know, were a close contact of someone, which I think would make a real big difference in making sure, you know, employers can have workforces and people aren't going to see that kind of disruption. I think probably for the foreseeable future, an adult who only has two doses or less, if they were a close contact, would still need to isolate. And I think people who have in symptoms of infection, they should continue to isolate to make sure they're not spreading infection. I don't think that would change anytime soon. That makes sense. Um, but we, in the past, have spoken about the role of rapid testing. Uh, do you still see it as being an important public health role? And how should it be best be utilized, especially when we're looking at places of employment? Yeah, no, I think it still has real value. Infections are still quite high in the community. I think many employers are accessing rapid tests through the chambers of commerce so that they can routinely test employer employees maybe a couple of times a week. I think that's still a really good practice. It shows that you can pick up about 90% of infections 
that might be missed just on asking about symptoms. So I think that remains a really good practice. I think if someone does have symptoms of infection, a rapid test is a good way to test to find out if you have COVID-19 in the absence of getting a PCR test. It's not perfect, but I think it'll give you a bit more information if you get a rapid test two days in a row. I think that probably means you don't have an infection with COVID-19. And so as soon as your symptoms are gone, you can come back to work and you don't need to necessarily wait the full five days to come back. And then if you're someone who's maybe a close contact of infection, someone else in the household had COVID-19, you can take that rapid test you know, a few days later to check if you did develop infection or not. And that's, I think, another good use of it. So I think there's several good uses of rapid tests. And the great thing is you can now get them much more easily at grocery stores, at pharmacies. So hopefully people will be taking up these rapid tests and making sure they use them. Okay. Thank you very much. I wanted to just let our participants uh, know that we have been part since May of last year of the distribution of the rapid tests. And at this point, uh, there's a lot, and I think it goes for all the chambers almost across Ontario, there's a lot of orders that are still waiting to be filled. Um, it looks like in part, maybe it's a bit of a supply issue, but maybe not to the same uh, degree because there's a high demand for the tests that are there that are really the logistics right now um, mean that there is a delay in it. I know that many of you have reached out to us to see what the availability is and we will keep you posted on it at the same time. You got a question from uh, someone from Whitley College and the question is do you rec recommend a third dose of vaccines if a child in the 5 to 17 year old age group has been double vaccinated and has had a confirmed natural infection? Does the risk reward assessment still fall in favor of getting the booster dose in that younger demographic? Yeah, so actually for most children, probably not. Uh, it's actually interesting what the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has put out. It's, they basically said that you know, in, uh, immunity from infection is going to wane over time, um, but the immunity from hospitalization, severe illness does not. Children are fortunately at already low risk of having those severe outcomes. And with two doses, their risk is so low that it starts to be uh, not as big a difference from the benefit of a booster dose versus maybe the side effects such as myocarditis or something a child might get from that booster dose. And so they're actually recommending that most children should get those two doses absolutely. But once they have those two doses, they probably don't need to get another dose unless they have underlying medical conditions or there's perhaps high-risk people within the home that you want to make sure their actual sure infection isn't going to come into the home or you know you're just a parent who wants to take the extra step to make sure your child is as protected as possible so most children i think don't need to actually get that booster dose if a child has gotten infection after the two doses that infection actually is a little bit of a booster so even if you were thinking of a booster dose I would say at least three months, you know, don't do a booster dose because that infection is already giving you good protection for those next three months. And the earliest you want to even consider doing that booster dose would be three months after that. And at that point, I think it's still very much optional. It's not something that's necessarily strongly recommended. The strong recommendation is just for those first two doses. Yeah, makes sense. Earlier in your presentation, you made a reference to long COVID. And this is something that we have actually heard from quite a few employers. So long COVID refers to the signs and symptoms persisting 12 weeks or longer after a person has recovered from COVID. And what employers are saying is that they hear this from some of their employees. They're talking employees are expressing fatigue, uh, brain fog, and other areas of it but not really clear on if this is long COVID or not. Is there a way that individuals can quantify that? Is there a place where people can inquire if those are the symptoms to, uh, that actually reflect long COVID? Is there an end to long COVID that we see? Do we see 70, 80% of people that after five to six months not having these uh, signs anymore? Can you give us a little bit of an overview that might make individuals, employees and individuals better understand long COVID? Yeah, so in terms of diagnosing long COVID, it's difficult to do. And I think seeing your healthcare provider is the best way to figure that out. I think they would be the ones best place to try to uh, wade through that complexity. We do see some people have long COVID symptoms and those symptoms do go away after many weeks or many months, but there's also people where it persists on and on and it doesn't seem to have gone away, unfortunately. The one thing we've seen actually interestingly enough that does seem to help get rid of long COVID symptoms was actually when people who had long COVID symptoms got vaccinated, the vaccine somehow actually triggered their body to actually get rid of those symptoms completely. 
And so, you know, if people who have long COVID symptoms are not yet vaccinated, I would really encourage them to be vaccinated because that does seem to actually address the symptoms. Unfortunately, if they are vaccinated and they have those symptoms, I'm not sure really what else at this point. This is really something new that I think the medical community is still trying to research and study to learn more about to figure out what we do for the long term. The best thing is, of course, not to get COVID infection in the first place. So hopefully we don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, Max, Max Fulton, thank you very much for clarifying it and especially redirecting those individuals to their uh, healthcare providers and uh, go forward from there. Uh, a couple of uh, individuals, business like predictability. So a couple of individuals always say, let us know what uh, to expect in 2022. We didn't think we were going to have this kind of a dialogue. If you would have asked me probably in October of last year or in September, October of last year, but do you sense that 2022 may follow the same cycles of the previous two years where a relatively calm summer would be following by surging cases and restrictions in the fall and winter? I think, unfortunately, that's probably what's going to happen. I think the first thing is going to be the next few weeks to see if those predictions of infections and hospitalizations actually kind of plateauing actually bear out, or maybe you start to go up a little bit, and we'll need to see what happens in the next few weeks. The weather's been on our side a little bit, and I think as the weather warms up and people get outdoors, that's going to help to keep things under control. And that's why I think we can look forward to probably a pretty good summer. But as things cool down in the fall, I am quite worried that we could see those infections and hospitalizations start to go up and particularly have a real surge over the winter again, which is why some of those things that I talked about that aside from vaccinations and you know reorienting our society and adapting a little bit for the long term is I think what we really need to do over the spring and summer so that we are prepared so that when that surge does come in the fall and winter, it's actually a much smaller surge and one that we can just absorb as a society and we don't actually need to really disrupt our society to deal with. Yeah, that makes sense. With the changes that the Ontario and actually the federal government have announced as well, will NAGA be supporting the removal of vaccination policies in the workplace? So a lot of every employer has put that in place. Uh, and are we seeing that this needs to be moved out? Is it too soon? Are we, should we wait for a year before such decisions can be made? What are your recommendations? Yeah, so my recommendation is that we should really continue with vaccination policies, especially if we've gone through the hard work of putting them in place. I, I don't think this pandemic is unfortunately over. I think, as I said, we might see a plateauing of hospitalization infections in the coming weeks. We you know, are probably going to see at least some kind of resurgence in the fall and winter. You know, if we've done the hard work to make sure that we have a safe workplace, I think let's make sure we keep it that way and not take away these policies too quickly. And if anything, I think we could even strengthen the policies by starting to require that after six months of your second dose, you should really have a booster dose as well, because that's shown to minimize the risk that infection is going to spread within your workplace. Uh, we actually put out a statement back in September recommending workplaces consider having a uh, vaccination policy. And we're going to really reiterate that in the coming days as well and encourage employers that if they do have a vaccine policy, they probably want to add booster doses to it. Dr. Hirji, you just brought something up and we only have two or three more minutes with you, but I, I, I want to take you up on what you just said, and that is actually the length of time that a vaccine actually has maximum protection for individuals. So we have had people who have received their booster shot, I think in Niagara, probably in December, a high number early on in January. Um, what are people's, and, and many of us have been double vaccinated as well, what is the timeline here that we're looking at? A lot of the alternative options that are there are longer term, they're not in place yet. Um, but are this group of individuals, are we expecting another round of vaccine clinics uh, and others in by June of this year because of the, the strengths of the vaccine trailing off? Yeah, so this is difficult to answer because we'll only know with the passage of time what actually happens with the booster doses and seeing what happens. We do know after about three months, those initial two doses wasn't providing much protection against the Omicron variant. What we're seeing out of UK data is that with the booster dose, at least 14 weeks out, you still have very good protection. It's not as good as it was right after you got that booster dose. It has waned a little bit, but it still remained quite high. And so that gives me some confidence that this you know, immunity is going to last for a little bit longer. Um, and at least, you know, getting us to the summertime when things and the risk is going to be much lower. 
can't say what's going to happen in the fall and maybe another booster dose campaign is going to be required then. But I think getting that booster dose does seem to at least for several months give us protection. The two doses though really doesn't for very long, which is why I think a booster dose is really important for anybody who's just had the two doses. Thank you very much. And on that note, I think we have to wrap it up. I have, uh, my computer indicates it's one minute to two. So thank you very much uh, for being with us today. And uh, to every participant who has joined us today, thank you for being here. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website at gncc.ca and will also be emailed to, uh, to all of you. So thank you very much for that. And if you are interested in reaching out to us uh, directly on a couple of other issues that you might be interested in, things like um, grants, subsidies, information that you would like or need access to, just please do reach out to us, info at gncc.ca works or to any one of us directly. So thank you very much for being with us and uh, thank you for joining us. So stay safe and above all, over the next couple of months, support local. It makes a significant difference too and all of you have done that. So thank you for that.